everybody knows Dior Testa, one of our senior faculty in, taught in the past in MIT, in Columbia, worked with Alvaro Cisa. You have a very colorful life uh, <laughs> that brought us to here. Uh, but I, I, I just thought it would be interesting to give you a little bit of background. The, the book is a book that recently came out, published by Tains and Hudson, um, with the editor Lucas Dietrich, which is one of the last funds of architecture in the publishing world. So we always, um, I don't know if Lucas will be watching this at one point, but if he is, um, we want always thank a thank you mm -hmm. and a hello to him. Um, as everybody who is in the field knows, books these days are becoming more and more, um, uh, it, it's almost a species that need to be protected yeah. in the world of architecture. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, I think of what triggers the beginning of this story, and this I think goes six, seven years ago, um, Peter Testa and, and Nevin Weiser came to Eric Moss and Ming Fang and the people who were running the school at the time with this idea um, to set up a robot lab that later will become known as the Robot House. And in a very unusual, but at the same time, sire fashion, it came to fruition pretty fast yeah. for the standard that many, we were not the only school flirting with that idea. We were probably we were the one that we managed to put it up and running the, the, fa the, the fastest. Uh, and I, that I always think is an interesting experiment. But the other thing which, I, if I remember correctly, because I was part of some, some of the conversation with these things was being generated, was in very such a sire fashion, uh, this move ahead without a clear sense of what we will be doing with, which is how it should be, mm -hmm. how innovation and the use of technology should be. Um, Architecture, like many times, always is kind of slow to react to technology. It's not like mm -hmm. robots were that new at the time, but certainly they were fairly new in the conversation of architecture, and it was fairly new in the way that Peter and Devin were proposing it, which was not necessarily associated with manufacture or with an engineer approach, which it was mostly where, how it was used in the academic context. So I think it's important to tell the story because um, this is something that, it would be nice to see more and more the faculty come with ideas and initiatives that try to come with a, not always a very clear sense of what is the end line, but with the understanding that there is something cooking mm -hmm. that it, need, it needs to get our attention. So just to give some kind of a short historical reference of some of the issues. Now, specifically uh, about the book, Peter, um, the, 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 the Maybe the, the first question to open, to open the dialogue, and I, I think you have some I illustrations to mm -hmm. accompany with whatever you have to say, is the first question for me will be, um, in the context of technology, yeah. why a book? Why, mm -hmm. why the, the, the necessity to put this in the context of a book? Which is, I would argue, a fairly traditional format compared yeah. with the work that the book tried to reflect. So let, let's start with the basics. Why, why the need to do a book? Um, I, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I think that books have a certain duration, you know, that they have a certain kind of presence and duration that in today, in some ways, even outlast buildings. You know, that um, so to be able to, uh, let's say, construct an argument that can sustain itself in a book as a format, I think is still relevant. Uh, and it doesn't impede other formats, right? So, I mean, clearly a lot of this material is in some ways easier to imagine, you know, a lot of video and so on the internet, on the web. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think that it's good to work in different formats and I think they call for different levels of investigation and also argumentation. So for a book to be sustained and also to develop an audience for a book today is quite challenging. And I thought that was a good bar that we should try to see if we could cross that bar. Um, so I thought the, that that was also, you know, they approached us. Uh, Dietrich, you know, Lucas uh, approached us. Um, so... Uh, it's kind of a blessing of a course when they approach you to do a book. Yeah, so. I find out <laughs> in the hard way myself. 
So I think a book is still a relevant format, actually. And I also think because this is a kind of digital, physical exchange, I think uh, the physical you know, dimension of a book is still relevant for this kind of work. So maybe to follow up with that, because I think that will go to the genesis about how you approach how to organize a book. Uh, as I said, the role of the house has six or seven years of life. Yeah. And we saw already in that period of time a series of what I would call different stages of generations yeah. of the work that was done. Uh, and again, you guys were not the only faculty working on this, but Absolutely. you guys, I mean, but you and, and, and Devin are some of the ones that basically you transform your old way of teaching yeah. oriented to, towards that, even though, so maybe to go through the different phases and talk about how the thing started, what you thought sure. it would be, sure. what happened, what it became, yeah. and, and how it has been evolving. Yeah, uh, I think it's an important point that there are actually a lot of different versions of this, and there are different people working in there doing different things. So uh, I, I really can only speak to uh, my point of view in that regard, but I would say that the first phase uh, is really back, I think we've got to take ourselves back you know, about eight years in the field and remember that that was a period of um, parametricism was kind of the main uh, focus of uh, architectural, let's say, activity, right, and discourse. Uh, and that, um, so on the one hand you had parametricism, which was the kind of homogeneous kind of digitality, um, version of digitality. And then you had, on the other hand, this uh, drive towards pushing the digital into fabrication, right? Digital fabrication, then moving to robots as kind of the next logical, seemingly kind of logical step. So I would say you had these two discourses, one that was maybe a kind of, um, I'd say digital perfection, an idea that digital uh, uh, could keep getting more and more higher and higher resolution, more and more, uh, let's say, uh, monolithic. And on the other hand, you had another dimension, which was, I would say, kind of um, a, what can we say, a kind of positivism, right, in which we would close the gap between the digital and the physical. Right, through this fabrication uh, metaphor uh, and, uh, and, let's say, genres. So, in a way, we, we uh, argued, in a way, against both of those camps. So we created another wedge that was really looking at... So you guys were like the Tony Blair. Uh, Tony Blair. <laughs> uh, uh, the Clinton Tony Blair. of digital technology. Yeah, exactly. So we created another wedge in there um, that I think is uh, becoming, actually, uh, more kind of the no new, let's say, norm, you know, like that's kind of more what uh, I think uh, most of us are thinking today, and I think your work also points in that direction, uh, towards a, a much more contaminated set of relationships between the digital and the physical, and also challenging the, the monolithicity or homogeneity of, let's say, digital uh, computing. Uh, so in that sense, I think we did two things. We broke the robot and we broke the computer. Uh, and by doing that, we created a new space uh, in which it's not about, I think, conflating. You know, it's, you know, it's a kind of bridging between digital and physical, but it's, it's about looking at them as non-correlated in the sense that there's always a gap between them. And that gap is, can be very productive. Uh, messy and productive for architecture. Uh, and I think that's, in a way, the first, the first and last phase are kind of in that, okay? In between, there is a period in which I think that also SciArc was the place to do this. SciArc, I don't think this could have been done anywhere else, and it hasn't been done anywhere else, because in large measure, SciArc had the digital acumen to do this, right? That the, the, uh, interface that we worked with initially was Maya, so which is the SciArc platform, by pushing Maya into uh, 
let's say, animation and motion control with robots in a physical space was new. And that was something that uh, our students uh, were trained to be able to had the capacity to think that way and to work through that, uh, which was very challenging. And I think that we were a school that could uh, take that on. And our students are fearless, so they were able to jump into this deep pool and without any kind of interface. So when we began, and I think this really extended for the first five years, is we had to build interfaces, motion control interfaces in this context of multiple robot systems in this synchronous and asynchronous combinations about motion, which is something that um, Greg Lynn mentions in, in his essay, in the introduction to the book, that you know, he says something like that the robot house's importance is that it's a fundamental investigation into motion and its relation and its potentials for architecture and design. So, and that in his point of view, that's something that everyone else should have been doing, he's arguing, that this was something that really needed to be done. And it's I think that's the first five years of work was, you know, a lot of experimentation. Um, to be to find ways for students to produce the to use this as a design platform and not as a technological, let's say, you know, uh, platform. So, uh, and I think that we succeeded in that first phase um, to the point where now I think we're in another phase, and I'm uh, I think for the past two years we can start to see the relaxation of that let's say, motion control uh, considerations and the tool is now becoming invisible to work inside of other procedures and workflows. So I, I think there's a really, for me anyway, this is an exciting time because in a way we've done the hard work and now we can maybe enjoy some of the fruits of that labor as a school, I think. Well, in relation to that, which I, I, one of the things, and, and this applied not only to technology, I, I mentioned this in the past, talking about philosophy, that architects, we tend to misuse and misinterpret yeah. pretty much anything that is available, yeah. which somebody will say is a sign of weakness. I always saw it as a sign of a strength, yeah. that the capacity the architecture has to suck from everything that is available, almost as, an, as a cultural sponge yeah. that it produces these things. But at the same time, we need to recognize that with the eruption of technology and the heavy advance and use of technology, also it presents certain rise of new ethical dimensions to the problem of it, which, I mean, it's, it's not so easy to quantify it, but I, I want to take you a little bit into, into that conversation to say, okay, how much you think whatever ethos the culture mm -hmm. of architectural design operates, let's say, and, and we can, in a way, fair and unfair, I think, through the digital process in the 90s and so on, is not that we're all in agreement, but there is a certain consensus that's been built about what has been the major shift. Um, do you think that the robot is just, the, the, the use of the robots and this kind of technology is another layer into that conversation or represents a whole different ethical dimension in how we approach design? I think it's another layer. I think it's really... Uh the, in a way, I think it's the robotic extension of the of the digital. Um, I don't think it's an entirely different paradigm. I think it's it's a deeper one. I, in my mind, I, th I think of it in terms of a kind of deep digitality. So you you don't consider it as a completely shift to the paradigm. You consider any let's say an augmentation of the paradigms that the digital eruption eruption put on the table. Yeah. I do, because I, th I think we can only, I think it, we're now in a situation where it's impossible to actually think outside the digital, um, that the digital yes, is I, everywhere. I would agree with that. So we can't think outside of that, so therefore this would have to be, in my mind, uh, 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 an extension, uh, a mutation, uh, and also, uh, but I do think that it has implications in terms of uh, understanding another dimension to 
let's say, design, in which now we can actually deal with shifts in hierarchy between image and geometry, which was not part of the original digital turn, let's say. So I know that's your interest also, so that suggests that it's not about robots, okay? Um, that is, but I do think that this serves as a, uh, let's say, as a, as a, uh, uh, in a way, a kind of a block on certain kinds of smooth transitions between digital and physical execution and so forth. So it, it in that sense, I think it is an extension of the digital. Uh, but a different one. I think it's a different time that we're in. And I think this new emphasis on the image uh, as, let's say, the generative structure for architectural projection, I think is, is the robots uh, offer us a very different setup because we're no longer looking at things through a singular image feed, but we can actually deal with a whole different set of matrices of vision. So in that sense, I think that it's a very powerful space in terms of design, but it's not just the robots. I think it's all these other systems of uh, image processing, image capture, scanning, and so forth. That There's a whole other set of, of imaging technologies, let's say, that uh, fit into this model. So to, to keep going on, with, on, on that, um this also was a conscious decision on your part. Like, let's say you mentioned Greg Lynn, but also people like Akin Menges yeah. and other people in, 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 in Europe and other parts. You, on a, it was a conscious decision to take out, let's say, the idea of manufacturing and production yes. of that. Yes. Why, why was that? Why? Why, why that was such a conscious decision? Well, there are a couple reasons. One is that we can't do it as well as the Germans are going to do it. I mean, there's no way. <laughs> We're not going to do it there. We just can't. We just don't have the means to do that. Yeah. So we, uh, our, our destiny is more conceptual, I think. Uh, and I also think that, uh, in a way, that problem had already been solved in industry. So, you know, like you were saying, industrial robots have been around since the 50s, so it's nothing new there. And uh, so I didn't see that really as a, something that was particularly challenging. And I also think that there's um, other opportunities that we were more equipped to engage. And quite frankly, I'm more interested in. So uh, I think that we always talked about this as non-fabrication. And initially, when we, the lab, as you remember, initially was a kind of much more of a clean room. Yeah, right? I, I, yeah it was I, more I kinda, abstract. I kind of I kinda like those things. Right? You remember? I have, a, I have some nostalgia for the clean room because in a way it was very abstract and we had no end arm tools and so it was purely a motion space and a hugely excessive amount of motion, right? Because we had six robots and they all have intersecting work spheres and so forth. So I, I think that was uh, a moment uh, that, that allowed us to be confronted with a kind of defamiliarization of our tools. So uh, I think that the students and designers who went into that space, ha it was very um, challenging. It was really challenging, and it was dangerous. So I think that was good, because in a way, the computer has a certain anodyne quality to it, and that you have to, and this is something you've talked about as well, create other kinds of resistance. right? And so I felt that that was one way in which we could in a way, crash out of some of the limitations that we were up against with, let's say, uh, working within the box and working within the, the current models of so or then uh, models of softwareization, right? So, uh, and I think building these kinds of, let's say, new apparatus um, that kind of deconstructed uh, the workflows that we had started to become overly conventionalized and started to produce very similar work everywhere. So I felt that this was a kind of a break, a block on that. And we could see, like you said, we didn't know what would come out. So in a way, uh, this idea of non-fabrication was also uh, a challenge for us to see what we could do as kind of suspension for uh, an opening to something else. 
Now, do you think at this point, um, again, if we go back to 92, 93, 94, whatever yeah. we want to put the beginning yeah. of it, uh, but by now we can quantify certain qualities of results. Yes. We know there are certain aesthetic paradigms that change. The, yes. There was a whole series of formal language that came to the table because of that. We have a whole series. It took us a while in terms of method. Mm -hmm. We started with quasi-scientific, blah, 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 yeah. and so on. But there are certain, certain qualities of architecture that we know that there is a before and after of yes. the, that digital revolution. Do you think after six or seven years to be operating with the domain of the robots that we can start quantifying what are the things that yes. it didn't exist before, and then you can say, look, there's, yes. certain, there's certain aesthetics, yes. methods, and so on, that you can say this would not be able to be done if we didn't do it with robots. That's a uh, tough question. I know, it's an unfair question, yeah, but... I, I don't know that the... But if we said that uh, without... If we eliminated the word robots from that, and said with this new kind well, of let's say, apparatus. Let's say expanded image capture okay, motion expanded. system. Okay, I would say then, uh, yes, I believe so. And I think we're just on the verge of, of really unrolling that, of that becoming apparent. That's becoming visible at this point. For me, I think that's where we are. And what do you think the clues are for that? The clues are what... You know, I, we don't quite have the language yet, but you know, I use this word fidgetal and fugly, right? Um, that is this kind of fidgetality in which we have a new ethic and also a new aesthetic um, that um, starts to, I think, be quite distinct from the earlier uh, versions of the digital. Um, that's, uh, I think, has a number of characteristics that we're starting to try to identify effects, okay? Some effects, and those effects have a lot to do with, and we see this also in art at this point too, that there's a fidgetality developing in, in art that has to do also with the kind of crossing of uh, digital effects and physical effects, and that um, also a kind of materiality that's put into question, right? That we start to put material into a new condition because it's it's already been, let's say, an image before it's a thing. So, and people are now in our visual culture are very attuned to these kinds of, let's say, tropes of the digital. So these are a new set of tropes that start to mess with those, of, with mess with those established digital tropes and also with the physical ones. So I think that's a very exciting set of new, uh, let's say, aesthetic qualities. Um, I would even say that the, Paul, the McCarthy show at the, at the Hauser and Wirth, I saw that as fidgetal. Um, I think those are maybe some of the effects that, we, that we're looking at um, that have uh, an estrangement to both the, let's say, tradition of sculpture that's being put into question through this kind of scanning and, let's say, decon or, or reconstruction of objects and then the, the let's say, displacement of different uh, techniques that are coming from the digital and the physical being brought together. I thought that was a very uh, poignant and powerful yeah. example and is certainly not part of the cute uh, and pretty, you know, that there's a certain kind of, uh, let's say, non-anodyne uh, quality to that work that, that isn't just uh, so easy to uh, categorize. But, okay, but one thing I, I find interesting with the way, what you're saying is, and, and I think to put it maybe in a larger context in terms of um, the trajectory of technology, which, again, mm -hmm. People tend to forget that the equivalent of this will be, I don't know, 80, 95 of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. And we are the really still at the early, early yeah. stages of what this thing will be. Yeah. But it's clear that to me, there are probably more, but in terms of our culture, the cultural design, there are two preeminent trajectories right now that I see in the pure technological apparatus, and then we can get a little bit more into the design culture 
in one way, there is a huge amount of effort put in technology to reclaim the idea of gesture and human interaction. Yeah. And we see this with the new iPads and the mega tablets yeah. and the appearance of the digital pen and drawing by hand or sketching in the air and then being yeah. translated to equations and so on. In one way, that is that argument, in a way, almost not to reverse, well, yeah, I would call it reverse engineer mm -hmm. of to reclaim a sense of humanity. Mm -hmm. In the other hand, there is another argument which also relates to almost the philosophical thinking. Well, actually, it relates to philosophical thinking, which is the post-human mm -hmm. idea of technology and design, which one could argue that the robots are the, yeah. gra the grandparents of that idea. Yes. Yeah. And towards that, I, to that notion, I, I wonder if... Um, which, of course, down the road, uh, we're going to see hybridization between those two things yes. again. But right now, one could argue that also the idea of robotics, not just robots, yeah. robotics could be as a way to start to think, okay, this may be a different audience, and this may, this may be the new users yeah. of consumers of architecture in a different way, and we see it also driveless cars and so yeah. on and so forth. So would you think that the, the body of work that you've been interested in being pushed into this notion of the post-human, a different kind of audience in which this technology became the user of the architecture, mm -hmm. or you think that the challenge or, or your interest would lie more to say, okay, let's figure out from this how we make, because in a way, for example, the whole iPad and smart tablets with a pen, I find in one in one way fascinating, but at the same time, I find it kind of disappointing. Yeah, like uh, we have to reclaim all the time yeah. going back to say, ah, now you can you can do sketches with you with the pen on these things, so you are yeah. again a human or something yes. like that. Yeah, no, I think that's a, uh, an interesting challenge because one of the things that clearly we explored early on was you know um, gestural interfaces for robots. And I was never too excited about that because it seemed to me that that was a limitation, a kind of, uh, let's say, an anthropomorphizing of the robots. And that the interest, I think, in these, especially, we made a point of picking these particular robots because they have a spherical work envelope that's super abstract, okay, so that they are not human. They're, they're, there's no sense that their motion space is that of a human, because they can. Uh, there's no front, back, and upside down. Okay, so they're much more like being inside of a computer in that sense. Okay, so I always thought the excitement was to get inside of the computer space, rather than to get inside to crawl back into, you know, some kind of human-centered, uh, uh, let's say, model. Uh, that I think we already occupy that space uh, ourselves. So uh, that this was a chance for a kind of, uh, I think, uh, more in the direction of the post-human model of thinking that would challenge us to see things differently and to also engage these other kinds of, uh, let's say, uh, modes of, of being and, and uh, existence. Okay, so, uh, but on the other hand, uh, I think that, you know, in the end, obviously, we're still humans evaluating these things, even if they're generated by machine vision. So I don't think it's such an easy distinction to make. I think we're now in this kind of half, half and half space. I think we're half human and half, uh, you know, post-human. So, uh, and I think that's an exciting space to be in. And I don't know that one has to make these hard and, and fast distinctions, actually. I, I tend to think that part of this new uh, condition is to start thinking in non-dualistic fashion, you know, so it's not uh, thinking in terms of dialectics, right? So I, I don't, I th I don't think uh, that there's a necessarily an ethical problem of working with robots, okay? Okay, I can buy that. Um, <laughs> Okay, le, le, let's go back to something you mentioned uh, early, which I think is a fascinating one, and at least for me is a fascinating one, um, between the notion of image and geometry, and, uh, yeah. and the idea, or, or, or maybe what would be also, I would say, a powerful interest in this place and many others, which is what I would call the, the, the revival of, of, of the drawing, in a way, mm -hmm. which I, I have, I, like anybody who was educated before computers, I have my fetishes and love for drawings. At the same time, to me, there is a kind of a dilemma 
on the idea of what constitutes the drawing of geometry if the geometry that we generate in, through these means, particularly the one that you're talking about, the motion and time base, yeah. um, there really are, for, in my point of view, there are images of geometry, are not geometry in that traditional yeah. sense, even though we know that it's always a mathematical equation floating inside this, that the, mm -hmm. one, the, say, the, the pure sense of the world always will bring it to geometry. But the question is, uh, in, in terms of, again, the mechanism of evaluations, like it took our discipline centuries to come to establish certain clear paradigms and guidelines about mm -hmm. the geometrical role of things. Mm -hmm. How how you think that the, the notion of the, the, the image capture and machine visions and these, all these kind of expandable repertoire mm -hmm. start to challenge how we relate to qualify the geometrical values of this if they're mm -hmm. still there. So I, 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 would, I would argue that, or I would argue not, I, I would be for the idea that geometry is still very much present. I'm not so convinced that they know what we understood of drawing is still exists. Yeah. I think we are in, in, a, in a new territory. So yeah. I, I, I would like to think what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I, I think that's a, a really current concern and an interest, and that in a way I think we have to uh, imagine that you know that that these are new apparatus. I see this as a new kind of apparatus, but in the tradition of architecture creating apparatus, uh, because it's the apparatus that makes the real, right? Um, and that uh, so in that sense, I think that this that you know we could relate this to Alberti's window or Sutherland's you know, initial pad and so on, that this is in that lineage, I think, that this, this kind of work is in, is another chapter, another development in that lineage. So, um, but I, I would say that, you know, that the, the kinds of projections that, let's say, projective geometry is based on is not a closed set. Right, that there's still possibilities for other kinds of projections. So, for instance, real-time projection mapping or real-time, um, let's say, uh, operations within with video and motion capture uh, within a non-Euclidean paradigm can, I think, push some of those, uh, let's say, descriptive geometry models into crisis, but could also expand on them. So I would say that I'd, uh, I think it's a very exciting set of possibilities that the image brings to us. Um, but I don't think, uh, I'm not so concerned about the future of drawing. I am much more interested in the relationship between image geometry and matter as being something more fundamental. So the larger picture. OK, let me ask you something more specific in terms of the evolution of your studios and seminars which uh, I, I've been lucky enough to be present in many of the reviews. Um, early, early on, I, I remember, that I, for a start, we used to do reviews inside the robot house. That's true. There was a moment that we, we all needed to see yeah. the robots moving and doing yeah. the stuff. There was a kind of, a kind of a process, what I would call uh, the truth, authentication <laughs> of, of the process, right? But at the same time, the, 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 I, will, I will call the, the three phases, the three stages, yeah. if I have to reduce it. Yeah. The first stage was really about defining the process and methodologies and the techniques in a way. And eventually that moved into what I would call a period of abstraction. There was, yeah. it, there was a kind of a, almost like the, the inspiration or the fuel that was triggering the work. It was fairly abstract or fairly not inventing from the scratch, but Kind of, kind of. Yeah. Kind but of. the more recent version of interaction, it takes, it goes back and it, it brings some kind of a more specific disciplinar mm -hmm. qualities in terms of start to work with historical and some much more familiar and recognizable mm -hmm. qualities of architecture from a specific historical buildings. I remember the the Pisa Tower yeah. and so on. Why? I mean, how, how do you see the connection between the three of them, or ultimately why? It went that way. Um, I think it, it um, it's an evolutionary development, and I think in part that the use of disciplinary. I think this has always been a disciplinary project, actually, uh, and I think that in a way this is a kind of conceptual installation rather than a technical object. I think that's how I mm -hmm. would describe this. So. 
Um, as a conceptual installation, I think it has to engage and challenge, let's say, questions of legibility in architecture. Um, and that the, uh, I think part of this phase that we're in right now is also, I think that the, the questioning of being able to use these technologies, let's, a vision, to see old things in new ways, right? That that's part of what technology offers us is this capacity to see things um, in, in, in without necessarily transforming the object, but just transform our way of seeing it and our way of uh, understanding it. So I think there's in that sense that this kind of there's another uh, potential there for the discipline to continue to examine its own history. I think that's part of the, how architecture gains new territory. Uh, so I don't see that at all as a kind of historicism, or, you know, we joke. I didn't imply that, huh? We joke, huh? I didn't imply we that, but... Uh, no, I know. But uh, we did joke about, you know, the robo-pomo uh, idea, right? <laughs> Which yeah. is, it's fun. Um, but uh, I think it's more than that. I think it's, it's quite a bit more than that. I think that it's, it's also fascinating to me because I, I'm kind of torn between, I have two aspects, I think. That one is that I, I'm very in, interested in architecture's history, uh, and I'm also really interested in the most advanced technology. So I'm always torn between these two things. So in a way, that's maybe just my own you know, predilections, but I also think it's, it's quite fascinating to be able to, in the, in the Pisa case, for instance, that we were able to start to see things that no one had seen before in those objects, potentials in those objects, and genres inside of those objects that maybe were, were paths or various kinds of genres that hadn't been taken, like, yeah. you know, but don't you think there is a little bit of concern, and, 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 yeah. that, and again, I mean this in the nicest yeah. way, which is, it seems, like a, it seems like it's the face of every evolution of new models of production that to give validity, we have to revisit certain yeah. historical paradigms so we can feel comfortable that, okay, finally this arrived, it yeah. belongs to us, yeah. we can be relaxed, we don't need to worry so much anymore. Yeah, that there's not that, a little bit of risk of that? Yeah, I, there is definitely a risk of that, of a kind of yeah, uh, compensatory or, let's say, la, la, lack of nerve, okay, loss of nerve. But I think it's actually nervy myself to do it because I think that it actually um, kind of rattles a number of different cages because it also challenges, in my mind, the kind of uh, stasis that the historians have gotten into and the critic, uh, the way in which the historians are always only looking at texts and not at objects anymore. So in that sense, it was also a provocation, I think, in that direction. You can see it that way, too. Because at the end of the day, look, technology always been hand to hand with any evolution of architecture ideas, right? I mean, yeah. That's how we move from yeah, that's how one period to another and so forward. on. Yeah. So talking about, I mean, we were talking about history and all that, Let, let's talk a little bit more about moving forward, uh, I mean, the, the, the near, the very yeah. near future about this, I mean, specifically, okay, l let's say, what, what, what should be the next version, I mean, what, what should be the next iteration of this, what, 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 what other things we are not putting on the table yet that are starting to percolate, which I think we do, we're doing in many ways on the software and interface, Yes. but it seems in a way that um, on the robotic front, yeah. Uh, and outside, outside of school, but in many other things, there has been a certain, which I think I would argue is the same with the smartphones and so on, that we are in an era of what I call sophistication instead of radical changes. Yeah. It's like we, we develop certain technology and yeah. we keep now, in a subtle way, get it better and better. Yeah. Uh, and it seems like in the, in the robotic front, it, it, it's suffering from the same qualities. It doesn't seem to be like massive massive ground changing. But maybe there is, and we are not seeing it yet, or what will be the territory in which this territory, what you call the... Fidgetal. The fidgetal, what, what are the next things? What are the next level of dirtiness that, that we can bring to the table? That's a really good question. Um, I think that, uh, I think we're trying to 
uh, understand how we can actually push this stuff into the physical directly to break down um, the boundary between, let's say, digital and physical objects. So I think that this idea, and we're st still, I think, in stages of trying to understand whether this will result in two kinds of parallel worlds, right, that are one that's really non-human or inhuman and the other one that's human, and that they will kind of coexist that they're, they're, and they'll cross over and touch each other once in a while, but they really are going to be two parallel realities, right? And I think design can operate in both of those spaces, but um, I, my sense is that probably other uh, faculty, or like Casey, is probably more tuned into what these next uh, dimensions of this, uh, uh, let's say, paradigms are. Um, I'm, I'm quite satisfied working out on this frontier of the close. I'm not much of a futurist, to be honest with you. I tend to not try to project um, beyond you know, something that I feel I can actually work on directly. So, um, the I'm future not. is promised to no one. Huh? The future is promised to no one. Yeah, the future <laughs> is promised to no one. So, um, but I, I do think that there's, I, I think on the, let's say, the, the apparatus side, we've talked about you know, the possibility of an, another generation of robotics here. Uh, and I think that, that that interests me in the sense that I think that, I don't think we've exhausted this model, but I do think we're ready for another physical set, another setup, another interface, and a push towards really dealing much more directly with animation, video, and imaging. Um, you just touch on something that I think is crucial, particularly when, when we have so many students in the audience, which is the idea to exhaust a project, which I yeah. think um, we are, and I think I think we are as much victims uh, as we are guilty of a certain tendency to move too fast through yeah. things. Uh, and I think to me that's a, it's a fake sense that sometimes yeah. the digital technology has brought to the table that yes. before that, because just by means of production, things were slower, Yeah, that right now we tend to move from one one, let's say, um, I will not say an idea because I don't like the word idea so much, but let's say we move from projects to project with capital P yeah. to another with too fast, yes. we, and up, we abandon the rest. It's yeah. like when somebody says, well, you know what, the digital form project is over. No, it's yeah. not. We just yeah. get started. We're just getting started. So I, I, I think this is important for in front yeah. of the students to, to discuss that you mentioned that, that, that you still commit to say, you know what? I'm not done with this. I still no. want to keep working on this. Yeah. And some others can take other yeah. approaches. And I yeah. think this is crucial. I think it's important for the students to understand to resist that anxiety yes. to move to whatever is new coming and to really yeah. to really allow that these things takes a long time. I always say that most of the architects or artists or musicians that we admire, they spend their whole life working around one, two, one or two ideas. That's true. And incorporating new technologies and so on, yeah. but there is there is an ethos that yes. operates that. Um, the, the last thing before we open to the audience, because I, I think we want to have some time for people to ask questions, since we are here also to sell the book, and the, our friends, if anything, Ingalls are in the back, so please buy the book and Peter will sign it. It will become a collector edition down the road. Um, Let's just talk for a bit about the, the book, how you approach it, how you, how you structure it, how you wanted to organize it, what, was the, yeah. what, what, was the, what, what went in, what got discarded, what was the, the overarching concept, how to put, how to put it together? Uh, yeah, uh, the, I, I do want to mention uh, and thank Julie Cho, who was the graphic designer on this book, uh, who we worked with very closely. Um, and um, I think that the idea was to create, uh, on one level, a kind of hyperlinking between projects so that projects would appear under several different thematics. Um, and so the book in, is in part structured as a, a, almost a, a kind of a dictionary, right, in which you have cross-referencing between all of these different projects. 
um, that suggests that they're, they're operating in a number of different techniques and domains at the same time, uh, as opposed to in a, only a one track. Um, so the book's really organized in three, three parts, um, instrumentation, representation, and fabrication. So um, those are three kind of general categories of work, and then each of those is broken down into a series of techniques um, that are techniques that, in a way, over time became sort of models through, let's say, these kind of quick fire experiments started building up and accumulating uh, different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of information, and also different visual qualities. And so uh, I left the, the actual, let's say, visual organization of the book entirely up to Julie. And I thought that was interesting because the, it, it overcame my own, uh, let's say, uh, hang-ups or thoughts about which projects m should be together. Um, we organized them more through tagging, so we tagged all the projects. And then she put them together based on images, based, based on color, based on a vari various uh, kinds of criteria uh, that were, uh, I think, started to produce interesting, for those of us who have worked on these projects, and I think the students, uh, I, which is the other thing that we, I think, really need to acknowledge here, is that this is as much a project developed by the students as anyone else, um, and that uh, starts to create different kinds of affiliations and associations between projects, and that are outside of any kind of chronological organization as well. Uh, and then, the other thing uh, we have in the, in the book is also a uh, series of that's, um, summaries of each of these seminars or studios um, that then describes as a description of, the, in a way, the, the brief or the uh, orientation of that project and some, uh, again, a, a collection of images that are cross-referenced back into the larger uh, book. So it's, it's, in that sense, it's, it's um, I think, mostly images. Um, there isn't a huge amount of text in here. Um, and, uh, but the texts are still, I think, quite important. Um, the, I think we, the forward by Eric Moss is really uh, important in terms of establishing this within the SciArc ethos of interrogative design. Uh, and Greg's also positions this within uh, uh, a disciplinary context. And then my, my contribution here is really uh, to try to understand or, or to articulate uh, a theoretical uh, framework for this work based on uh, an experience of it. So in a way, by reapplying um, the work back onto itself to develop a kind of categories um, that we could start to discuss the work under. Um, so uh, it's, I think that's the main, cool. the main thing. Uh, one last thing, though, yep. is we also have this section that actually documents the, so there is a technical dimension to this um, that documents the actual lab and uh, all of the interfaces that have been developed here, which are you know, quite significant, really. I think that the uh, work on the interface, motion control interfaces, um, I know this is not maybe SciArc's number one interest, but out in the world, this is actually quite significant. And um, the students who worked on this, uh, on those um, motion control interfaces, have gone on to yep. um, quite uh, significant contributions already outside of SciArc in a number of really leading edge companies. So uh, I think that on that level, that there is, I think, uh, various kinds of contributions in, in, in this work. Um, and hopefully we'll continue to, to make breakout uh, contributions in other areas. I would like to open to a couple of questions from the audience, if there is any. Yeah. 
There is a chair with your name here, David. <laughs> That's the other day. Uh, I'm, I'm just noticing uh, uh, what's on the screen. Uh, it's not unusual for representation of the robot panels, which is uh, depictions of uh, the machine in operation. Uh, normally, with uh, technology, we think the technology is generic, and we celebrate the thing you make with it. So we only see renderings or pictures of what we made with the printer or whatever. Here it seems, uh, and it always seems to have been like this with the robots, the spectacle of seeing the machine in operation seems as much a part of the project as what you make with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's almost like uh, seeing video of uh, people building a, building a house, like, a, like a, the representation is the labor. Right, so uh, I, I'm I'm just curious. Like uh, I, I agree, like they're very compelling and spectacular to see the robots working, to see the labor of the machine is really provocative. But also, it seems like uh, at some point, uh, it almost necessarily needs to become generic, mm -hmm. and then we have to look at what we make with it. Right, so is this uh, uh, I've over the years, I've been curious, like, uh, what's going to be the kind of killer application of the robot? Uh, I feel like it still hasn't come, even though it's pervasive in the industry, it's on every automobile assembly line. But still, it doesn't seem like uh, the killer application of the robot uh, has ever really come into play yet. Do you think it's a problem with the robot, or we just haven't gotten there yet? I don't think it's a problem with the robot. And I would say, you know, also, um, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, your question, I think, is pertinent. Uh, but these are, a lot of these videos are five, six years old. So um, if we went through this chronologically, I think you're going to find a removal of the tool over time. Um, and if we look at the more recent stuff, I would say from the past year, two years, um, we're, it's, I see it becoming much more generic. Um, and that the robot, that the, let's say the evidence of the tool is becoming less and less visible. And um, I think that's positive. I, I think that's definitely something that I, I, I'm all for. Um, I think that the initial, let's say, excitement of the motion of the robot and the you know, interest in documenting that and engaging that is evidence in this kind of, let's say, uh, you know, uh, celebration of this as an event, right? Uh, and initially, I think that a lot of the work actually is in the control of the robot. So that's appropriate if that's the area of investigation. And that there's demonstration also of, let's say, the ability to also match move robots in digital and physical space, which is a complex and challenging problem, okay? That has uh, a lot of potential implications for design down the road, right? So I think you are looking at something that's nascent developing and therefore you know just as the digital paroxysm let's say of you know digital modeling is fading the robot is going to fade too um, from that picture uh, and uh, I think just as Ernan was saying you know initially we had reviews in the robot house and uh, at one point Ernan said to me you can't do this anymore <laughs> and I thought that was awesome um, as a provocation, you know. Um, so uh, that, uh, and I agree uh, that so you know pulling away from that. And I think students now, this current generation of students, is not infatuated with robots, and that's purely just a means to to something else. And but that something else is, I think, also still in development. So I don't know if that's a reasonable response, but. Um, so in terms of, I guess, representation, it seems like a lot of what 
um, we look at in terms of the, the products of the robot's work um, is sort of, I mean, as you said, an extension of the digital, which is in some way an extension of the human hand. Um, is there, or is it even worth asking, like, you know, where are we in terms of asking sort of what the robot can do that the human could not? Um, and I mean, on the one hand, there's like the consideration of like precision or something that a robot has over the human, you know, but is it, um, yeah, is there, do you feel like there's any, I don't know, where do you feel like we're at in terms of sort of, uh, you know, what the machine can produce beyond the human? Well, for me, I think both of those points about what the machine can produce isn't my interest. So um, uh, that, that may be the interest of a number of other people working in here, but that's not really my interest. My interest was more to use this as, a, as an apparatus that produces a, a conceptual, let's say, uh, problem for the designer, as opposed to getting the robot to produce something. The robots don't make anything. We make stuff. Um, what the robot can do, in part, is to make it clearer what uh, is involved in how things make things, right? Um, so, I, but I think that's a conceptual problem. I don't think that's a manufacturing or a robot problem. And I'm going to make a confession that, you know, I don't really, I'm not particularly interested in robots. I'm not a roboticist. I have no qualification. You tell us that now. <laughs> You know, I have no. I Thank have God, if you were if you were interested, I don't know how much more we would have spent. Uh, so this isn't about robotics for me. This is about architecture. This is about theory. It's not about robots. Uh, we're not qualified. That's not our area of expertise. And quite frankly, we haven't done anything to the robots. We're barely robots... qualified to do anything. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why um, we're architects. <laughs> that's why we're architects. Exactly. But um, so, you know, we haven't done anything to the robots physically. We have, and in fact, um, you know, uh, what we have done is on the software side. Uh, much more on the software side than the hardware side there. Uh, so. Um, I don't, uh, I mean, I, uh, I think other people, uh, other faculty, I'm sure, are more interested on, the, on, on these other topics, which are valid. I'm not saying they're not valid. I'm just saying that's not my main interest. Okay. So, um, you have one? Yeah. Okay. Last one. Um, continue with your comment about like this is an architecture project. Um, if you were to make a stretch about linking the operation happening in the robot house to, do you think we will be able to narrow down the research to some sweet zone of architecture typology, let's say? Would that be a good direction you think we should pursue? Because seeing the image here and it brought up serious, like it's really interesting interlace between scale and resolution. I'm talking about mm -hmm. literally the diameter of the nozzle and the length of the robotic arm, how big the operation surface is, the fear is. Mm -hmm. is. So again, the question will be like, if you want, do you think it worth to ask that, is there a sweet zone for architecture typology to take place here? Uh, well, um, I think that there's a number of different research programs that can go on in this. Um, I do think that uh, syntax, you know, ex thinking about multiple objects and their composition or relationships as being something that can be explored in this context is something, for instance, that Devin's been doing that I think is very promising in terms of this kind of let's say, very architectural set of concerns and interests, um, and using this setup because of the uh, ability to have multiple matrices of vision allows us to reconsider how we're actually composing objects and how what, what the role of the digital object and the physical object might be in that construction of, let's say, models of uh, composition. Um, so, I, yeah, I do think that there are some sweet spots that are beginning to appear for us. 
Uh, but I think there are a number of them. I think it's quite early in the game, as Ernan was saying, for us to be basically shut this down around one area. Um, but I also think it's kind of too early to make, um, to, to also, I think, make judgments about uh, what the successes and failures of this kind of work are. Because in a way, I don't think, um, I don't think there was an object here of, uh, let's say, a goal. I think this is kind of goalless in a way, uh, at least uh, for me, at, uh, the setup here. Was, is more speculative than it is about trying to solve a specific problem. Uh, and in that sense, I think Syrik's been incredibly generous um, to give that kind of space. Uh, and I have to say I'm incredibly appreciative of Syrik, and I love Syrik for this, and many other things. But I think the fact that Syrik would give it uh, these resources and time and um, take risks uh, in terms of allowing uh, that kind of speculation or inter inter interrogation, as Moss would put it, uh, and now speculation, I think is, is uh, really positive. So I don't think, I think we're still very early. I think we're 19, you, you know, uh, 96 in the robots, uh, in this version of them anyway. I think we're 96, 97. I think we're still at the beginning of something. No rather than at, uh, in any kind of mature phase of it. So we're, we're I think, it's, it's not something I can really assess at this point. I think that's crucial, the idea of speculation for speculation's sake. I yeah. mean, that's truly what academic environments are for, and sometimes we tend to forget. Yeah. Because um, professional degrees and many other things, we, sometimes we tend to forget that many other things yeah. have to happen in that context. So uh, to conclude, I want to encourage you, all of you, really buy the book. Uh, books, books are, <laughs> no, 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 it's not a joke. Books are important. Book has the capacity to define moments in history. This, this is an important book, and this is a book that over time will become more important. Um, some, some of us remember the, the catalog of the Deacon Show, the, the, the first, the first on animated form. There, there are certain books that are crucial, that they define a particular moment. It's, it's, a, it's a Polaroid of a moment in history. And books are not ethereal. They, they have a capacity to survive. And this, this was, and it is a, a, a project going on. But this book is a radiography of a particular period of time. Yeah. So I, I'm saying for that reason, not because we are here and we are and promote the book. This is an important book. It's, an, it's a book that is part of the, of the school. It's part of the culture of the school has been embarked for the last 15 years or so. And it will keep guiding our, our, our north. So in that sense, it, it, will be, it will be an historical document. And you're part of this process, then you will look back. And for like many of us who we were educated in the 90s, mm -hmm. we look at that as a phenomenal historical moment where, the, the, where the, all the computers and animation software came into play. And we, you, we take it for granted now. We take it as it's an everyday. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's a fairly recent history. And, yeah. and, and still, we need, we need books. Books matter. Books have the capacity to uh, accumulate knowledge in a way that no other yeah. form can. So Peter, I want to thank you for doing well, the thank book. You thank so you much. for the conversation. And hang around and get your book signed. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>